I was over there about four in the morning and didn't see anything, so I don't know when it happened. Yeah. Yeah. If I can have your attention, please, we'll go ahead and get started with uh, tonight's board meeting. Uh, Mr. Simmons couldn't make it with us tonight, so I'll be filling in as the chair. Um, so I hereby call Monday, April 8th, Patrick County Board of Supervisors meeting to order. Uh, Mr. Smith from Pleasant View Baptist Church. You would kindly lead us in, so stay in and kindly lead us into uh, the invocation. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the honor, the privilege, and the freedom to be here. I ask for peace and prosperity for our world, our country. I ask for peace and prosperity for our county and our neighbors. I would ask for discernment over our local leaders as they look over the issues that are brought before them this evening. Amen. Amen. Mr. Kendrick, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now a moment of silence and recognition of our U.S. military serving here and abroad and all of our public services. So first thing, approval of our meeting agenda. Uh, Ms. Sims, do we have anything to add? Um, yes, we need to amend uh, and add something to new business. Um, add an item, additional fiscal year 2024 Child Services Act appropriation. Okay, can I um, get a motion for to approve? Approve the agenda as amended. Get a second. Second. And a vote. Mr. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Aye. Kendrick? Aye. Mr. Wood? Aye. And I as well. Uh, approval of meeting minutes from March the 11th, 2024, and March 19th of 2024. Make the motion to approve. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Um, vote, Mr. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Kendrick? Aye. Mr. Wood? Aye. And I as well. Motion carries. The approval of bills, claims, and appropriations. I move that we approve the bills, claims, and appropriations. Second. And a second. Uh, for a vote, Mr. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Kendrick? Aye. Mr. Wood? Aye. And I as well. Motion carries. All right. Next, we have a public hearing. Uh, the Patrick County Board of Supervisors will hold a public hearing here tonight at the. Um, 
in the courtroom uh, to discuss the proposed Patrick County High School cellular phone tower. The hearing will begin and action of this meeting will be taken. Um, I now open the floor to milestones. Are you here ready for? Got a couple of slides uh, to run through, so I think we're going to pull those up. But um, thank you, Supervisor Perry and uh, members of the board. My name is Matt Penning. I'm the Director of Development for Milestone Towers. We are the applicant and the developer of this application. Um, so just in way of introduction, uh, our company's headquartered in, in Virginia. Uh, we've been in business for over 20 years uh, with over 150 towers constructed. Um, we've partnered in Virginia with several municipalities as well as school systems. Uh, a few of those are included on the screen here, um, just in case other folks can't read them. Uh, just a, a few, Albemarle County Public Schools, Cumberland County Public Schools, Fauquier County Public Schools. Loudoun County Public Schools, Prince William County Public Schools, uh, Patrick County Public Schools, to name a few. Um, and again, I want to express my gratitude to the school board and then also the superintendent for working with us uh, to find a solution for the critical infrastructure that this project would provide uh, to the county. And this is the reason we're here tonight. It always starts for us um, on the need for a site. Uh, our company policy is never to build a speculative site. We already have a signed lease with Verizon um, for a tower at Patrick County High School. So Verizon would be the first tenant to come on the tower and it would be built for up to four wireless carriers. But I'll take a quick step back. This is a third party map generated and it actually shows the aggregate coverage of the, all the wireless carriers that serve this area. And generally, areas of red are unreliable coverage, um, and that's what characterizes this one mile radius and above and beyond uh, with this map, is generally unreliable to poor coverage in this area. And this just goes into a little bit of greater detail about what Verizon is trying to achieve. Obviously, address the coverage deficiency that they have in this area. Um, as far as that's the coverage, and then also capacity, they add another um, site into their cellular network, which opens up and creates more capacity. Um, so obviously for a high user area like Patrick County High School, which has a thousand staff and students approximately. Um, the surrounding area has over 100 households and then uh, 4,300 average daily travelers along Route 8. Um, so adding the coverage in this area as well as offloading capacity on the existing surrounding sites to improve and enhance connectivity in the area. And this is just a uh, um, an aerial showing the proposed location relative to the property boundaries. It's a 67 acre property. Uh, we've worked with the school board to uh, site it on the northwestern side of the property. Um, and this gives it uh, over 1,200 feet from the closest residence as well as 1,700 feet from Route 8 and Salem Highway. So the large school parcel allows us to uh, site it in a way that it screens it from surrounding residents and from the roadways. Um, that's one of the benefits of partnering and working with a school board um, on a large public parcel like this one. And this is a more zoomed in view and a plan view of the actual tower compound. Total footprint for this site is going to be less than 2,500 square feet, um, which is less than a 50 by 50 square compound. Um, it'll be enclosed by an eight foot tall fence with privacy slats, and we're going to be utilizing the existing access road 
Uh, we did some work with uh, staff and the schools and the planning commission on feedback, taking the original location off of the field and moving it actually next to the existing pole yard, which is used by uh, the community college. And that gives you a view, a uh, picture of the location of the proposed tower site. Um, we'll be going right next to the existing pole yard. So um, just a brief summary and then um, I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague for just a couple notes on safety and the technology. Um, but just to summarize here, what we're trying to do is add critical infrastructure uh, in an appropriate way. We're meeting all the requ county required setbacks. Um, we're locating it on the school property so it won't interfere or impact existing or future school use. Um, we've already cleared the um, hurdles with any of the regulatory agencies, so the FAA, the um, Virginia Department of Historical Resources, um, any kind of environmental impacts. Uh, we've already cleared all of those on this project. And then as of February, the Planning Commission had recommended approval and found the project consistent with the county policies um, for siting of telecom facilities. And just in the interest, I know uh, Supervisor Perry, you had an opportunity at the one of the planning commission meetings, but just in the interest of the board, the rest of the board, and then also the general public, I was gonna bring uh, Andy Peterson up to speak to some of the tower safety topics. Um, if, if that's... Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Supervisors. Um, my name is Andrew Peterson, um, a licensed professional engineer in Virginia, as well as a handful of surrounding states. Um, I've been involved in the siting of these types of facilities now for uh, about 25 years. Um, and my specialty is radio frequency design and electromagnetic emissions compliance. Um, so that's what, that's what um, I'm here to talk about tonight is the, the compliance aspects and the safety aspects of this facility. Um, I'm gonna follow along on my computer because I can hardly read that without my glasses, but um, <clears throat> the first thing we wanna talk about is uh, the FCC's authority on this matter. Um, they have the sole jurisdiction on the uh, regulations regarding electromagnetic field safety. Um, I won't read the uh, slide to you, but um, basically the FCC's um, guidance is, is codified um, in the Code of Federal Regulations with the sections quoted on the slide here. Um, and that is the law of the land when it comes to um, electromagnetic safety. Um, what we're required to do as uh, tower developers and, and wireless providers is demonstrate compliance with the FCC guidelines. Um, so. When we have a new facility uh, like the one that's being proposed, we, it, it's not something that we can go out and measure um, because it's, it's not on the air yet. So what we do uh, um, and, and what has been deemed appropriate as the uh, method of demonstrating compliance is uh, we, we uh, perform um, calculations um, to uh, determine what the anticipated exposure levels would be from a facility once it's on the air. And we do that using the uh, formulas that are prescribed by the FCC in um, a document that uh, they deem the uh, FCC Bulletin uh, 65 uh, from the Office of Engineering Technology. Uh, that document gives folks like myself uh, the formulas that we apply um, using upper limit assumptions and the actual spe uh, specifics of the facility. We apply the formulas in that document and using that information, we can uh, determine the anticipated exposure levels. Um, and because we use uh, multiple factors, uh, upper limit factors, um, we're really looking at a worst case scenario for, uh, for maximum exposure at ground level. And that's what we've done here. Um, and, and I have copies of that report um, that I can hand up 
uh, after I go through these slides. But um, in this case, we've studied this facility. Um, my office, uh, I've authored a uh, report here demonstrating that as proposed, the facility would be uh, less than 1.4% of the applicable FCC standards, and that's at all locations of public access. Um, and that is with the facility as proposed. Often I get, I, I get the question, well, what if there are more carriers that, that jump on board, AT&T, T-Mobile, Dish Network? Uh, there's really only four in the marketplace at the moment. Um, so what we do is we go a step further um, and evaluate the anticipated exposure with all of the carriers in the marketplace on board, and I've done that here. Um, and on the second page of the report, um, the calculation shows that even with worst case assumption in all four carriers, we'd still be below 8% of the applicable FCC standard. So still compliant by a wide margin. Um, if we could flip to the next slide. So um, the, FCC, the FCC exposure limits, just to give everyone a sense of, of uh, how they developed, um, they're based on recommendations by the bodies that you see here, which include the IEEE. Um, OSHA, uh, ANSI, which is the American National Standards Institute, and the National Council on Radiation Protection. Um, and and we, there, there's more information on, on the development of these standards at the link below. So Milestone, as a matter of course, um, what they do with their facilities, and this isn't done by all tower developers, um, but what Milestone does is uh, after construction, they always have a third party uh, go out and verify that the uh, anticipated exposure levels that uh, an engineer like myself can calculate are what's really out in the field when all's said and done. Um, and th this is just a depiction uh, showing one of the projects that Milestone has developed in the past. Um, and what you see with the, with the white labels that surround the building there, those are all the locations that they test. So they test inside the building, outside the building, uh, in areas that folks congregate, in areas that, that aren't used that often. They, they kind of have the, uh, are pretty exhaustive testing done. Um, and what we found over the years, and, and I've, I've done this type of testing myself, um, and what we found over the years that the, is that the, the testing that's done, uh, the levels that we see are typically on the order of a tenth or so of the worst case upper limit levels that are calculated using the formulas. And that's for a number of reasons. Um, we calculate the upper limit assuming 24-7, 365 maximum exposure. We, we use 100% uh, ground reflection, um, which basically quadruples, can quadruple the output, um, and, and a whole host of other upper limit assumptions. Um, so when, when uh, my calculations reveal that you know, uh, with four carriers, it would be around 8% or so. Um, it's, it's likely that that number is, is under 1% um, when we go out and, and uh, measure. Uh, this next slide gives uh, a sense of um, <clears throat> other common radio frequency exposure sources and how they compare with um, what we call a, a macro site outdoors, which is the third from the bottom um, for those that are looking at this. Um, the gray bar is the allowable limit, and that's based on uh, the frequencies that are being used by the device. And then the, the yellow is um, the actual typical exposure. So you can see that um, the, uh, the, the macro site, as we term it, which is the, the uh, second and third from the bottom, um, relatively little exposure when we compare to other sources uh, of emissions. Um, most notably, uh, the mobile phone, which is the fourth from the bottom. Um, you can see that there's much greater emissions that an individual is exposed to by the, the device, and that's purely because it's, it's much more proximate to us. It's in our pocket, it's next to our ear, um, and uh, that's, that's truly um, the, uh, the, the more uh, meaningful source of electromagnetic exposure. Um, one note that I would make is that exposure actually goes down uh, when you have a cell phone tower that's close to you. 
So uh, the folks that are using this, the, the faculty and students that would be using this tower at the school, uh, because they're now closer to a tower, their mobile phone uh, has to transmit with less power. It doesn't have to yell as loud for that tower to hear it. So their exposure is actually decreased. It's kind of counterintuitive, um, but the uh, devices that we use are smart. They conserve battery when they can. So if, if they know that they are heard by transmitting with less power, that's what they do, which, which actually will decrease an individual's exposure when they're closer to a facility. Um, and this, uh, this slide um, just indicates some of the distances um, that the uh, towers that, that uh, Fairfax County Public Schools has. Um, <clears throat> Um, and we can see that there, there are 32 towers uh, that are listed here, and uh, 27 of the 32 that are Fairfax County Public Schools towers um, are within 600 feet of uh, the closest school building. And, and that's what's being proposed here, that roughly that distance. Um, so this is not an abnormal type of installation. In fact, it's, it's pretty common. Milestone um, has done quite a few of these over the years. And that's all, unless there are uh, specific questions for me. I'll, I'll, I'll hand up that uh, report if that's okay with everyone. Yes, please. Does any member of the board have a, any questions for Yeah, I, I do. Well, I understand the distance from the school, but uh, there's been some concern raised by parents about uh, students learning on those climbing poles and students on the track. So, Participating in extracurricular activities out in those areas, what does that do to exposure for the students? So the, the, the report that I just handed up, um, that contemplates all areas of public access um, surrounding the facility, um, even, even an individual uh, at, at the base of the tower. Um, the, uh, the energy from these types of facilities is, is mainly directed toward the horizon. Um, so uh, if you picture it a lot like a lighthouse, where if you're at the base of a lighthouse, there's still enough ambient light probably to tie your shoes, um, but most of that, that light, that energy is being directed out toward the horizon. Okay, thank you. Sure. You have anything? You have anything to um, I'm just wondering on the particular site that we have here, um, I mean, Patrick County is roughly 311,000 acres. <laughs> And, and it looks like we're going to service the roughly 1,000 students of the high school and roughly 100 homes nearby. Is, is this where we're going to get the biggest bang for the buck in the county, placing it there? I mean, we talked about the traffic on Route 8. If we moved it farther south, you pick up 103. Um, I'm just wondering, before we have to start sticking them every two miles, you know, are we really getting our biggest bang for our buck at that particular location? Well, I think Matt can maybe... Uh shed a little bit more light on this but with this is where Verizon has expressed that they have a need and um, high schools in particular um, they do generate a lot of uh, wireless uh, demand um, I think we all know high schoolers I, I have three of them at the moment or two almost three of them um, they they uh, use their devices an awful lot and all that all that usage uh, requires strong service um, it requires robust capacity. So um, this, this is, uh, it's not surprising to me that Verizon has, uh, has uh, indicated that they have a strong demand in this area and, and need a site in this area. Matt, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. And I think Andy covered most of it, but I think the challenge that we have is that um, we develop the infrastructure where the carrier indicates they have a need. Um, and Andy kind of alluded to it, but capacity. So you have high number of users, not just the school, but all the activities that go along with it. Um, sporting events, any kind of community events, it's a big driver of activity. So. Um, when they start to get a, you know, they're, they're monitoring their network 24-7, they have 
what they call capacity indicators, and that's what's triggered them here, is that they're having the surrounding cell sites indicate issues that they're no longer going to be able to serve the area. Obviously, they're not doing a great job right now, and so before it gets any worse, they're looking to add that capacity and add that coverage here. But to your point, which was, can we go further uh, east, southeast, um, and that, um, if I'm understanding you correctly, going south, um, you lose a lot of topography. You lo lose a lot of terrain as you go down south. And that was one of the uh, reasons we cited on the northwestern side of the property as well is um, there's a huge grade change, at least 100 feet as you go uh, north to southeast on the property. So um, this is an approximation in terms of how much it will serve, but it will have a greater impact than one mile in terms of connecting with the other sites, improving the cellular network overall in Patrick County too. So this, you know, I wouldn't expect this to be the only site that they develop, but um, this is one of their highest needs right now. Mr. Kendrick, do you have any, any questions? No, I haven't had time to read all these papers though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I've, I've got a question, a couple of questions. Um, so, uh, you know, when you were given the lighthouse reference, so is this gonna be uh, directional or omnidirectional antennas? So the, the uh, antennas that Verizon installs are, are uh, directional. They're, they're panel style antennas. They're about the size of a shoebox, except elongated uh, to about six or eight feet, depending on the exact model that's used. And they're generally arranged, which is going to be the case here, um, in, in a, on a triangular platform. So in, in three sectors uh, with, with a few antennas in each sector, um, they're, they're placed on a triangle platform with, with each one of those sectors on one of the three faces of the triangle and then um, pointed mainly toward the horizon. Okay. Um, the, um, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought here. Um, okay, um, I think that's all I have for right now. I have okay. one, one more question. Sure. Um, is first responders, um, 911, that sort of thing, or is this tower accessible to the police and fire rescue? Yeah, um, so Milestone will make space available, um, and Matt, again, can probably better answer this one, but th they'll make space available for first responders, um, and that's very common to have co-location by, uh, by first responders. Um, I figured out my other question. What wattage? I know, uh, especially when we're talking about RF and radiation and factors, I know uh, bandwidth and the amount of, of watts that's pushing behind this is a lot. Um, roughly, what what wattage are the antennas pushing, or what's there, there's uh, a number of radios um, in a, in a number of different frequency bands that Verizon's licensed in. Uh, the most powerful of those radios um, is going to be 320 watt radio. Um, there are some other bands where they're using 160 watt radios. Um, but the, 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 uh, yeah, that, that would be the, the most powerful, if you will, radio is, is 320 Watts. Okay. And so is that what they're going to be using on these towers, the, the 320 Watts or? Yeah, the, they'll use a 320 Watt radio on here. Um, and then they'll use four other radios at 160 Watts each. Um, in some of the other frequency spectrum that that they're licensed in, okay. and that's that's a typical Verizon uh, arrangement. Okay, thank you. I um, think that's all we have for. Yeah, there's one more. Okay, good. Yeah. I think they've got, if I'm not wrong, they've got one tower at Rotary Field, 
And as a crow flies, that wouldn't be far from a mile from the high school. Do y'all have anything on that, Tara? And I believe there's one on Note 81 up there on Carter Mountain, too. I'm not, I'm not familiar with it. I was just asking Matt if, if he is. Well, I know there's one at Rotary Field, and I think there's one up our, uh, uh, where the old results building used to be on Carter Mountain. Just wondering why you need three right around Stewart and folks over around Firestone can't even talk with a tin can of string. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll, I'll let Matt talk to that, yeah. So part of the application, um, was to look at existing sites, tower sites within the two mile radius. And that's included in the application package as well. There's two that were looked at. Um, one was an AM radio station tower and we've contacted the uh, owner of it and they don't have structural capacity on that tower to accommodate um, a wireless user. Now the other site, um, there's one site that's solely used for 911, and I'm not sure if that's the one that you're referencing, but that also was, uh, Verizon had reached out to them and they said th there's no ability to add commercial co-locators. It's purely a 911 tower. Um, and then there were two other towers that were looked at, but those were short in height and closer to the town, or I'm sorry, to the, to the kind of the center. Um, those are about, I think, a mile, mile and a half to the north, mm -hmm. north of the site where the crow flies. Sounds about right. So those were those were the sites that were looked at. Anybody else? That's all. You, Mr. Morgan. That's all we have for right now. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Wood, do you have anything uh, from the school you'd like to add or any remarks or any? Okay. All right. At this time, I'll open the floor up for um, uh, public comment. And the first that I have listed is uh, Gail Spencer. Gail. Am I misreading your last name? Uh, Spencer. Okay. I don't know a lot about these cell towers, uh, but I know I do know at the March 11th meeting, Mr. Simmons made the statement, and it, it it was quoted in the paper, and I'm going to paraphrase here, that because we were so upset over solar farms, that he was surprised we were not upset over cell towers because they were worse in putting off exposure and causing cancer. So I would like to know where he got his information from or if we're being panhandled something else in this county. Uh, to Mr. Wood's point, this just seems like band-aids that are going up all over the county. Um, I understand that the school, the high school, needs internet uh, for the computers. For their cell phones? No. They don't need cell phones in their classrooms. Shouldn't be allowed. If it is, then there's a problem in this county. But back to Mr. Simmons' point, who can tell me or that these towers are not dangerous or why did he make that statement that would be my question are these towers safe and are we putting up are we spending money out of this county that it's just band-aids how many to Verizon tower sites are they going to say we need I realize we need internet service all through this county, but what's the exposure to our kids at the high school? I guess is my 
my question. Okay. Okay. Anybody that can answer that, I would appreciate it. So thank you, and uh, of course I can't speak for Mr. Simmons, but I will say that there, the solar panels are not hazardous. Really, and Mr. Perry? Really. There were two events, just recent events, where one, the solar farm caught on fire and people were told to uh, quarantine in their homes because the chemicals were in the air. Right. Another one was just recently destroyed by hail. Yeah. If you and think we've that also been you've here. also been lied to about the cadmium in the panels and I didn't and say cadmium, about is, the cadmium well that's I'm the hazardous material instances that y'all so told us if there's no uh, toxins in the panels and these towers are admitting even one percent of <laughs> the recommendation well a little is more than none so that's where You've got some radiation from the tower. You got no radiation from solar panels. But I can't answer for Mr. Simmons. Okay. So there, there's you asked for an answer. There's my answer. Okay. Okay. Right. And I also failed to <laughs> um, to say we do have a three minute time. Of course, she was way under three minutes. And um, and again, thank you for your your concerns and comments. Um, Next, I have, is that Dean Spencer? Y'all may have to turn the light down <clears throat> behind me. I can, I can relate <laughs> to So that. they can still see. <laughs> I can relate. Uh, first of all, God is good. Okay. Amen. <coughs> we got a small sample of that today how great he is with the solar the eclipse uh, I want to say to the board thank you each and every one of you for all the good that you do in this county <coughs> okay I want to give a shout out to Scout Troop 69 for their hard work and efforts for the beautification of Patrick County Thank you, Troop 69 uh, and the Scouts of America. We should learn from our people, our young people, of uh, the value of beauty. $35,000 for long, majestic views is what has been paid for mountain land here in the county. I Googled Patrick County and received pictures of mountain views, Appalachian Winery, Blue Ridge Parkway, Ferry Stone State Park, Jeb Stewart Birthplace, Saddle Overlook, and Groundhog Mountain. I'm dissatisfied with my governing bodies from here to D.C. Lying, deceit, and corruption. It's up to you, Board of Supervisors, to do your part in the conservation and beautification of Patrick County. Do the right thing. Do good for Patrick County. Solar panels, cell towers, and wind turbines are not good. Necessary, but not good. So do good so I don't have to say thanks for nothing. Uh, I was at Forsyth Hospital recently. Looked out the window, and I counted just with my eyesight, which is not that great, 14 cell towers. And somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I counted with the insight. And like you say, they were closer than two miles apart. Now, maybe that's a necessity in Winston-Salem. I don't see it here. The uh, load on these towers, does that create more of a hazard? with the students and the load that's going to be on those towers there? I don't know. I mean, you have, just about everybody has a cell phone. Anybody in here not have one? I think they do. And most of them have them with them. I left mine in the car. Studies have shown these things cause cancer. People wear them in the shirt, they get lung cancer, they get heart cancer. 
it happens so don't say that it's not going to happen it happens it can happen they've proven that murphy's law takes effect thank y'all thank you And we have uh, Melanie Beasley. Good evening. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry I'm very nervous. I'm not a public speaker. But I do feel that it was important to come out to speak to you all tonight. I hope you all received the packages that I mailed you in the mail. I come tonight with extreme concern over the placement of the cell tower at Patrick County High School. When I first heard about it, I had some initial concern, but decided to do some research. After spending a few weeks looking at studies and dates, data on the matter of cell phones, towers, and proximity, I went from being concerned to being horrified that this is even being considered. Across the board, you cannot find a study anywhere that suggests anything less than 400 meters is considered acceptable. And in regards to school, because you should always err on the side of caution with children, 1,500 meters, which is 1,640 feet. This is less than a third of that. It's not just the children I'm concerned about, it's the teachers as well. Most studies in the packets that I sent you show that women and children are the most susceptible to this um, from the EMF damage. While Verizon rep, uh, representatives will repeat over and over that they follow the FCC guidelines, we all know that the FCC's pockets are being filled with lobbyists to get this done. They have repeatedly ignored the American Academy of Pediatrics, asking them to please reevaluate their stance on these towers at schools. What Verizon cannot do is tell you that these towers are safe. They will just say we are following FCC guidelines. That's where they start and finish every time. To the contrary, they do warn their shareholders. In their 10K report, that they, they are they um, admit that they are required to pay significant awards, settlements due to personal injury and wrongful death lawsuits associated with um, alleged health effects. The county should also consider its own liability at exposing our children and teachers to damages from long-term exposure to radio frequency radiation. What you'll find is that most insurance companies have electromagnetic field exclusions. Why would they have those? Because they're dangerous. Wireless companies themselves define radio frequency radiation, electromagnetic radiation as a type of pollution. That's the word used. Now, no one in this room can say that, the, say that this is a safe idea with no health concerns. In the case of innocent children, we should always err on the side of caution to protect them. We have been in Patrick County school system since 2003 when my first child started. Over 20 years, we have a sixth grader now. He's at the top of his class, and he no doubt helps the, the test scores in this county because he has got the highest GPA pen for the last two years in every class. We will pull him from the Patrick County school system if this goes through, and I encourage other parents to take this stance as well. Our first job as parents are to protect our children. I will not allow him to go sit in a building with his blood cells and brain cells being scrambled all day. In the least case scenario, the EMF is disrupting his sleep and giving him a headache. Worst case scenario, he ends up with cancer. Time. I encourage other parents to take this stance, even if they have to, even if, if they have one single cancer diagnosis at the tower, it's one too many, and I will not gamble it on mine, and I hope that you would not gamble it on friends or family members that you know. The proposed tower is anything but safe. It's dangerous, and we have put too much open land in this county to put it right on top of our children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did receive the packets. Thank you for sending those. That gave me plenty of time to read, reread, and reread to help digest and the questions I had, the ability to look things up and, and further look into the specific studies. So thank you. All right, that's all I have on the uh, uh, public hearing for the phone towers. I wanted to, I was late. I did not sign up. I wanted to share mine. Okay. forgot my glasses so all right so my name is Heather Morrison Spence you've known me my entire life I am a mother of seven I have been a registered nurse for 29 years I was born and raised here me and all my sisters were born and roommate Dean at the hospital I moved to Floyd for 18 years where your father was my neighbor 
until he passed away. And I moved back here in 2012. I think most everybody here knows me. I requested to speak at this meeting due to some concerns I have regarding the health and well-being of the citizens of our community. Numerous valid concerns have been brought to the attention of the Board of Supervisors regarding the solar power plants as well as the um, cellular tower placement at the high school. It is my opinion that some of the concerns have been ignored, downplayed, or remained willingly ignorant of the concerns of the people they were elected to represent. I would like to share with you the reason that I am passionately against introducing carcinogens or toxic radiation that could have negative effects on our community members. In May 1999, after a completely healthy pregnancy, I gave birth to a nine pound, one ounce baby boy who was born with a rash. After much testing, it was determined that he had a very rare immune system disorder called Langerhans cell histiocytosis. At that time, LCH had no known cause, no known cure, and a newborn with the disease had a 20% chance of survival. My son was treated at Duke University Medical Center for many years. He started chemotherapy when he was five weeks old. He completed his last treatment just shy of a year, and he has been well for 24 years. The statistics for Langerhans cell histiocytosis have improved over the last 24 years due to much funding and research. It is now considered a cancer. It is caused by a somatic genetic mutation, meaning something that he was exposed to in utero, altered his DNA and his immune system. It is still rare, but in newborns, it does now have a 40 to 50% survival rate. In closing, I ask you, do you know what it is like to ask a doctor if your baby will get well and they say, I don't know? Or how about ask the doctor, will these medications help him get well? And they say, I don't know. Or is it true that he has a 20% chance of survival? They would never tell me that. I found that on the internet at work and they whispered yes. Do you know what it's like to ask God, to beg God, to take your life instead of your child's? I ask the Board of Supervisors to strongly consider your decisions, actions, and words as they will have far-reaching effects in the near and distant future. I do have a question, Doug. You're saying there's no cadmium in the solar panels? Correct. What is in them? Cadmium telluride. It's a completely different It's still cadmium. Element. How can it not be cadmium if it's cadmium telluride? Right. I, even asked is, is, I even asked Holly Weber, who is a scientist, legitimately okay. employed. Why is this not petroleum? Why is this not crude petroleum? Straw man. Or, or you, you've got two part hydrogen or water. You've got hydrogen. You've got oxygen. So you put them together, and I mean, the then why do they call it cadmium? Loses. It's cadmium telluride. It's a completely different subject. And when it burns, it's a completely different chemical. It's got its own material safety data sheet. It's not the same thing as cadmium. The National Institute of Health says it is. It's not the same. Cadmium telluride is not the same thing as cadmium. All right. Okay. So, thank you. Check in plastic bottle. It was made with petroleum products. All right. Um, Millstone, do you have anything you wish to add or maybe any questions you would like to address? Yeah, I mean, at first, the first thing I want to say is just thank you for coming out and and uh, testifying. And, and certainly safety is kind of the common concern I'm hearing. And, you know, I just want to reiterate a couple of things. Um, as far as the loading on the tower and that weakening the tower, I think the gentleman was getting at the idea of as you add additional carriers on the tower, will that weaken it? Will it make it more susceptible to breaking? And the way we go about engineering and building and designing these towers, um, that starts 
when we put in the steel order and we factor it with enough load that it has more than enough structural capacity on it to accommodate uh, four full carrier loads. So um, in addition to that, every time before we go to put on a new carrier, um, we will run a structural analysis with their proposed equipment so that we're validating um, the amount of space that we designed on the tower is matching and, and holding up to the new loads that come on every time. So um, the towers are designed um, in accordance with the building codes um, and we've never had any structural failure in the 20 plus years we've been in business. Um, and we've built towers from here down to Florida and that have survived uh, or withstood hurricanes. Um, as far as just the safety, I don't want to rehash. We obviously had an Andy uh, kind of go through everything, but the only thing that I would, I would add on to is um, to date there have been no credible studies that have shown uh, health impacts from low levels of radio frequency energy. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about antennas that are 200 feet in the air um, and the impact at ground level. Um, the only scenario, as Andy mentioned, you're not going to get into a high exposure scenario unless you're directly in front of the antenna panels. Um, and that scenario exists, but it's on rooftops, rooftop installations. Um, and in, in DC, Northern Virginia, there's a significant amount of antennas on rooftops and there's precautions put in place so that people don't get in harm's way. So. Um, again, the exposure we see on ground level from the extensive monitoring data that we have, um, and Andy showed the slide going to Fairfax County Public Schools, um, which has uh, over 30 towers that have been on site, some of them since the 1990s, um, and none of those sites have ever been out of compliance with the limits. So, you know, we certainly take that commitment to compliance and safety seriously at Milestone. I know that was part of our deal with the school board as well, is making sure we have that commitment to compliance. We submit annual reports um, and make sure everything is above board and compliance. Uh, if it's not, and it, again, it's never not been in the history of our company, but if it's not, then we're in default. They can terminate the lease, you know, there's a mechanism for that in the contract. Um, but that's, that's all that I have. If you have any other questions, I'd be glad to answer them. you have anything else, Mr. Marshall? Mr. Kendrick? Mr. Wood? In, in my, my own, well, I'll have a statement after. No questions if you run out. Okay. Thank you. Uh, board members, do you have any, any comments? No. Mr. Kendrick, no. Mr. Woods. I got one question. So what are the federal requirements as far as signage on the towers and what, are, what, what does the signage say? Andrew Peterson again. Um, so uh, the, the federal guidelines are very specific uh, when it comes to uh, signage on these types of facilities. Um, the underlying premise is that an individual needs to be made aware uh, when they enter an area where the uh, exposure environment may exceed the guideline limits. Um, so as Matt said, um, that really only happens when we can get within 10 feet or so of the antennas. Um, so situations like rooftops, um, water tanks, where sometimes we have antennas on the catwalk, um, billboards, um, folks that, that uh, by virtue of their occupation uh, may be um, on top of these structures in areas uh, where uh, the antennas may be even within arm's length. Um, so also, as Matt said, is we, we take precautions and, and the, the FCC has very specific um, instructions as to how those precautions are to be um, enacted. And, and um, one of those is signage. Um, there's barriers that we use, there's signage. Um, 
and um, locking ladders, things of that nature, um, where there, there are uh, 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 devices put in place that not only uh, warn folks that they're entering potentially areas where the exposure levels may be exceeded, um, but also are obvious, you know, where they have to cross uh, an orange barrier or, or there's a locked door or gate with a sign on it. Um, so to answer the question directly, those signs um, are, are blue, yellow, or red, um, depending on um, the specifics of the environment and what levels uh, could be exceeded. Um, and in a, but in a tower type situation where we have antennas that are 200 feet above the air uh, or, or in the air above ground level, there's no potential for an individual um, from the general public to be exposed. Um, so there'd be no signage um, other than a placard uh, with an emergency uh, network operations center number um, that way it's usually on the compound gate um, that way if there's something going on in, in the compound um, or, or there, there's a there's a number to to, to, to contact um, Verizon or, or milestone um, so th there really would be no signage required for a, fil a facility like this um, uh, with the exception of up near the antennas um, anyone who's climbing this tower is going to be someone who's trained on how to uh, mitigate the exposure, um, but there's still some signage that will be required up by the antennas to let them know, hey, this is above this, uh, this level, um, there could be exposure that exceeds the, the, the federal guidelines. So I hope that answered the question. I have, I have one question. What about the guys on the power poles that are climbing and right beside them? They're 30 to 40 feet, correct? Yeah, so the, the um, exposure level from a facility like this, even at 30 or 40 feet above ground, would be still would be nowhere close to approaching uh, the federal guidelines. Even if other companies come on board and use that tower and emit more EMF and radiation? So yeah, how, many, how many people can come on board and increase the exposure of the people around them? So, so right now there's, there's only four uh, national providers in the marketplace. We've got Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, um, and Dish Networks, who's building out their, their uh, network now. Um, so it's common that the co-location occurs in increments of 10 feet. So we've got Verizon at 195, uh, the next at 185, so on at 175, and the, and the lowest in this case would be 165. And that's what's contemplated in the report um, where, where um, I've evaluated uh, a f the fully loaded scenario, at least that, that we can see today. And even in that scenario, um, if we examine a height of 40, 50, 60 feet in the air um, immediately uh, adjacent to this tower, we still would not approach the, the FCC guidelines. You, you really have to be within about 10 feet um, and, and in front of the antennas. There's very little energy uh, that's, that's directed downward. As I said, it's, it's mainly pointed toward the horizon. So um, you, you've got to be, you've really got to be in, in front of the antennas and, and very close. Um, so if if the county should need some of that space, then that would be a total of perhaps five antennas or five? Sure, okay. yeah, so yeah, it, right. And, and uh, I'm pretty familiar with, um, with county emergency services equipment and, mm -hmm. and generally it's 800 megahertz or a, a lower in frequency uh, trunked system and, and relatively low power, 100 watts or so output power. Um, so it would increase uh, the exposure levels, but but only fractionally. It wouldn't it wouldn't make a whole. Um, it wouldn't make a big difference when we talk about levels at the ground compared to what what's already been contemplated. All right. All right. Thank you. Sure. I would just like to say that you did mention that there are no studies regarding um, long term damage. There may be no American studies, but there are studies. There's Brazil. There's Germany. There's Syria. They did ten year long term and they have very firm results. And my question to each one of you, would, would you have one in your yard? Would, would any of us have one in our yard? If the question is no, you should not subject our children to this. All right. Um, 
Thank you. And any other comments from the board? No, that should be it. My, my only comment is, um, you know, I've had several people reach out to me about this, and, and there's a lot of unknowns, um, you know, just like it was last month. Um, I don't know if it's a money thing. I've never seen exactly how much rent uh, the Patrick County Public Schools is going to receive for this particular piece of property. Uh, but if what Miss Beasley says is uh, true and she pulls her students, that's uh, that's a chunk of money for every kid you pull out. Our ADM is going to drop every day. And, you know, you're robbing from Peter to pay Paul. Um, you know, Patrick County Public Schools uh, land makes up about three hundredths of one percent of our county. They make up about 110 acres of 311,000 acres. And and once again, I come back to what I originally said. I know Verizon said they wanted to hear, okay? Well, that's good for Verizon, um, but we're not in the business of, of pleasing Verizon. Um, I said when I ran for office, it's for the greatest good and the greatest number for the long run. And this is something we're getting into. Uh, like I said, no long-term studies. I just don't like the idea of it sitting right there beside the high school you know, whether it's emitting radiation at higher levels, low levels, no levels, we don't know that yet, um, you know, for the next 30, 40 years. Um, th that's just my opinion on it. I just think there, we should maybe look at some other places um, that we could uh, put a tower that benefits more people that even if there is a one-tenth of one percent chance of it being dangerous, that's a whole lot to risk a thousand kids and staff to every day when they walk through that door. That's all I have. Mr. Kendrick, you have anything? Mm -hmm. right. um, I have some some further things I would like to study as well and look into, and also where we are one board member short. Um, well, I, I, I think we need to, to close. Uh, I think I, we need to close the public hearing before y'all yes, vote. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Just. All right. So at this time, I'll uh, close the public hearing and uh, address the board for any last comments and any motions. I would move that we table the approval of the Patrick County High School Cellular Tower uh, until the next meeting. I'll second. I'll second. Uh, so I call for a vote, Mr. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Kendrick. Aye. Mr. Wood. No. And uh, I, I, I as well uh, to table this until next month when we had an opportunity to look through a few other things and to have all of our board members present. <laughs> right. uh, thank everyone for uh, comments and appreciate it. All right. All right, so new business. We have a uh, proclamation for National Library Week of 2024. So, whereas the Blue Ridge Regional Library offers opportunity for everyone to connect with others, learn new skills, and pursue their passions, no matter where they are on life's journey. Whereas our libraries have long served and trusted institutions, striving to ensure equitable access to information, and services for all members of the community, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, or socioeconomic status. Whereas the Blue Ridge Regional Library, five branches, and bookmobile strive to adapt to the ever-changing needs of our communities, developing the expanding collections, programs, and services that are as drivers as populations that we serve. Whereas our libraries are accessible and in inclusive places to promote a sense of local connection and advancing understanding civic engagements and shared community goals. Whereas the Blue Ridge Regional Library plays a pivotal role in economic development by providing resources and support for job seekers, entrepreneurs, and small business. This contributing to local prosperity and growth. Whereas our library system makes choices that are good for the environment and makes sense economically, creating thriving communities for a better tomorrow. Whereas the Blue Ridge Regional Library is treasured institution that preserves our collective heritage and knowledge, safeguarding both physical and digital resources for present and future generations. Whereas public schools and other libraries are essential public good and fundamental institutions, 
in democratic societies working to improve society, protect the rights to education and literacy, and promote the free exchange of information and ideas for all. Whereas libraries, librarians, and library workers are joining library supporters and advocates across the nation to celebrate National Library Week. Now therefore, be it resolved that we, Patrick County Board of Supervisors, proclaim National Library Week April 7th through the 13th, 2024. During this week, we encourage all residents to visit their library and celebrate ventures and opportunities they unlock for us every day. Ready, set, library. Uh, we have some representatives from the library here. Would you guys, anything you would like to say or add? Uh, you thought it very well. Uh, it was written very well, and um, I could brush up on my reading as well. So uh, thank you for all you do. Thank you for supporting the community. We greatly appreciate you uh, posting county business. They're in the library, so people have an opportunity to come in and look at things uh, and help see what's going on with the county. So thank you all. Thank you. Um, does the board have anything to add? No. Um, I move to proclaim April 7th to the 13th, 2024, as National Library Week in Patrick County. I'm proudly so. A second. And a second. We have a motion and a second. A vote? Aye. Mr. Kendrick? Aye. Mr. Wood? Aye. And aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you all. All right, next we have uh, West Piedmont Workforce Development Board, the consortium agreement. All right, is Mr. Knight here by chance? If not, not a big deal, okay. All right, so this is um, kind of a formality we have to do every couple of years. Um, Patrick <coughs> County is served by the West Piedmont Workforce Development Board. Um, across the state, there are numerous regional workforce boards. Um, ours consist of Patrick County over to Pennsylvania County. Um, local boards shall carry out their responsibilities and partnerships with chief elected officials in consultation with regional workforce partners. A chief elected official agreement outlining responsibilities is required where a local area includes more than one unit of local government. This agreement must specify which entity will serve as the fiscal administrative agent as well as the roles of the individual chief elected officials in regard to the local board nominations and appointments and carrying out all other responsibilities assigned to the chief elected officials under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Chief elected officials are encouraged to meet at least annually to review program performance for the grant as well as the performance of the fiscal administrative agent as designated. Um, and we recommend that the Patrick County Board of Supervisors approve um, this consortium agreement. Any questions? Question? Right. No. So do I have a, a motion? I move to approve the West Piedmont Workforce Development Board Consortium CLIO Agreement as presented. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, for a vote? Aye. Ms. Kendrick? Aye. Mr. Wood? Aye. And aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Next, we have a resolution for the Virginia Fire Services Board to fire an EMS safety system. Um, so I bring forth to you tonight um, a resolution to move forward with Virginia Fire Services Board to perform a study of Patrick County's fire and EMS system. Um, this is a free service provided by the Virginia Services uh, Fire Services Board. Um, it will provide us an unbiased third party review. Uh, Walt Bailey, the um, the guy who's over this that we've been speaking to, he has experience as a volunteer, paid staff, as well as he's also serves as an elected official in another rural community. Um, they will come in. We expect them to do this um, beginning in the summer. Uh, they'll come in, they'll meet with county administration, paid staff, and each volunteer fire and rescue station. They'll be looking at our organization, budget, personnel, training, fleet management, our ESAC council, and of course, like I said, the fire, uh, Patrick County Fire and Rescue Departments. Um, what this will do will generate a long-term strategy that is implementable over the next few years. 
Henry County, Pulaski, and other similar counties have completed the study and have been, have been able to start implementing the recommendations from the study. Um, but to move forward with it, we have to have, where it is a free service um, that is provided by the Virginia Fire Services Board, the Board of Supervisors does have to pass a resolution showing that we are in support of them coming in and doing this. Uh, we met with the ESAC committee first week of March, maybe? Something like that. Yeah, anyways, we met, we met with the ESAC committee about a month ago and went over this with them. Uh, we wanted them to hear directly from Mr. Bailey on what the study entailed. Um, I believe they were all very excited about the study um, and in support of the study and, and letting them come in and talk to them about, you know, um, challenges and opportunities for our fire and EMS system. Any questions on this? I move to approve the services of the Virginia Fire Services Board, the VSSB, in conducting a complete and thorough review of the fire and EMS system in Patrick County. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Call for Aye. a vote. Ms. Kendrick? Aye. Mr. Wood? Aye. And I as well. Motion carries. All right, uh, next we have a contract award for the RFP uh, for 2024-1101, the opioid misuse needs and assessment. Uh, Ms. Shuff? Received a uh, $50,000 grant from the Virginia Opioid Abatement Authority for the needs assessment and issued an RFP to determine the appropriate use of the um, opioid settlement funds that were to receive. Um, the, uh, so we are recommending that the contract be awarded to Omni Institute. Um, we have negotiated with that vendor. Um, they're also being um, used by two surrounding okay. localities, and that presented the opportunity for us to get a fee reduction for their regional data collection and for some travel expenses. Does anybody have any questions? No. Um, do I have a motion to approve? I move that we approve that as presented. I second. All right, call for a vote, Mr. Mr. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Kendrick. Aye. Mr. Wood. Aye. And I as well. The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. All right, next we have um, a solid waste license. Ms. Smith. Yes. Um, so up until February 29th, 2024, Patrick County gave exclusive rights for solid waste collection to one private company. This included dictating their solid waste hauling fees and prohibited other solid waste companies from operating in Patrick County. Beginning March 1st, 2024, Patrick County's transfer station transitioned to a pay per ton for solid waste haulers, which is in line with other localities in Virginia. It is Patrick County's belief that not restricting private business through an exclusive local government agreement will allow better adaptability to market conditions resulting in long-term benefits to Patrick County citizens and businesses. Our solid waste ordinance does require or permit and license for solid waste collectors, which, which is what I present to you tonight. Um, it states that persons engaged in the business of solid waste collection or refuse disposable disposal for compensation in Patrick County should possess a license to verify proper equipment and personnel to collect and dispose of refuse and that the method of disposal used is, is in accordance with state recommendations. Um, attached in your packet, you'll see a simple application that trash haulers will complete and renew annually for a minimum fee of $25 per truck or a maximum fee of $100 per company. So if this is approved tonight, um, solid waste haulers will be able to pick this up and fill it out tomorrow um, and then we we will be in compliance with our ordinance. Uh, where can they uh, get the application? At? Uh, we'll have it online and in the county administration office. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? I move to approve the proposed solid waste license uh, effective April 9th, 2024. I have a motion to have a second. Second. <clears throat> Call for a vote, Mr. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Kendrick. Aye. Mr. Wood. Aye. And aye as well. Thank you, Ms. Sims. Motion carries. Right, so next we have um, the Agricultural and Natural Resource Extension Agent. Uh, Ms. Sims? Yes, um, as we all know, unfortunately, well, and fortunately for him, our um, 
Agricultural and Nat Natural Resources Extension agent uh, recently resigned his work with the Cooperative Extension to be a um, full-time farmer, which we're very proud of, but it leaves a gap for the Cooperative Extension. Um, unfortunately, these positions don't get filled immediately, um, has been the standard practice of the Virginia State Cooperative Extension. Um, and we know the need for this type of support to our agricultural producers. Um, and so the uh, Patrick County Board of Supervisors has expressed that we draft a letter and that's what we've done here uh, with the help of Ms. Alt at the Cooperative Extension. Um, so you'll see that in your packet where we are, um, we have drafted a letter to the director um, of Virginia Cooperative Extension asking them to please, please expedite the rehire of this very important position in Patrick County. Anyone have any questions? And I'd like to say thank you um, for y'all's support of our ag industry. Board member have any questions? Mr. Wood, Mr. Kendrick? I move to approve a letter of support for the agriculture and natural resources extension agent position. So I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Aye. Mr. Kendrick? Aye. Mr. Wood? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Thank you. The motion carries. And we have a resolution to appoint uh, Ms. Beth Sims, the county administrator, as the local board of social services as um, an advisory committee. Is that? Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, so this is. Um so in the state of Virginia, Department of Social Services can either have an administrative board or an advisory board. Um, there are 31 other localities in Virginia that have an advisory board. Um, due to recent turnover um, and, to be honest, difficulty to, to get um, a, a board and quorum, um, it has been recommended by the regional office of the DSS for Patrick County to transition to an advisory board, um, at least for the foreseeable future doesn't mean we can't always go back to an administrative board um, so in your packet you'll see um, the resolution that supports this um, and what this does when I, i've spoken to quite a few other localities that have done this um, to kind of see what this means um, and the one thing that I, they keep coming back to is this you know dss is a i think they how they word it and judy correct me if i'm wrong it's a state agency but locally administered is that correct right and we, we straddle the line between being a state entity that also is considered a locality, yeah. depending on the work that you want to get done. And when you kind of bring it under the umbrella of the county as an advisory board, it gives them a better seat at the table really when it comes to to local government you know now judy will be a department head just like all our other department heads um and there'll be more kind of oversight oversight from the administration um and she'll have more it'll just be better um lines of communication between patrick county administration and um, dss um, a direct line board members have any questions if no questions um I uh, call for a vote or a, a motion. I move to adopt the resolution appointing Beth Sims County Administrator as the local board of social services for Patrick County. So I have a motion to have a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Call for a vote, Mr. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Kendrick. Aye. Mr. Wood. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, old business. Oh, we got the CSA. <laughs> CSA item we added to the bottom of new business. Yes, thank you. Ms. All right, so um, the FY 2024 Child Services Act uh, appropriation. Thank you for the opportunity to give a little context to this request. Um, as you may or may not be aware, um, the Office of Children's Services sits at a state level. Just wanna give a little background on how these monies flow through the social services system. The Office of Children's Services mandated a number of years ago, the Children's Services Act, or what we call CSA. And that provides a funding allocation for typically foster care expenses in the different localities in Virginia. Um, there are certain things you have to do to be in compliance to receive those funds. If you are not in compliance, it reverts to local only money, as we're all too familiar. We've seen over the past, I would say two years, in the retrospective analysis I've done, a huge increase 
in the amount of local only money that we've had to shell out in Patrick <laughs> County to cover these services. There's a narrative behind that. There are reasons why that happened. Um, and I'm gonna go over some of those reasons with us right now. So how did we get here? For a very long time, we had no staff in the CSA coordinator position. Um, that is crucial to keeping track of all of the items that make you in compliance for receiving this funding. Because of that lack of staffing and the lack of oversight for it, um, we went far out of compliance for approving those CSA funds. There was also a lack of a robust QA process involved in how we documented cases coming into the agency and how we met the requirements for applying, to, applying for alternate sources of funding, 4E, Medicaid, CSA funding, even. We found out that we were not in compliance in many cases. We can't retroactively go back and fix all of that. So what we've tried to do is, in the course of getting caught up, we've put things in place to prevent that from happening going forward. So now we have a QA process in place. We meet weekly to review the cases to make sure that we have all the stakeholders at the table weekly, to make sure that applications are filled out for 4E funding, that applications are filled out for Medicaid funding, that we have all of the documentation in place before we go into these meetings where they approve services that CSA will pay for. Those are happening weekly. Um, we also, this additional ask that we're making of the county is based on our historical spending to get us where we were getting out of the hole before, essentially. We are putting measures in place to hopefully ensure that we will not need to spend all of the money that we're asking for. We are at a record high of foster care cases in this county. As of today, we are at 42 children in our custody and our care. Typical high for this agency in the past was 15. <coughs> Managing that without staff, without appropriate oversight and guidance has resulted in kind of the mess that we're in. So we're taking additional steps, not only to ensure compliance for CSA, but to see how we can reasonably and safely drive down those costs associated with foster care. We have a number of children who have been languishing in that system that need to be addressed. So we have hired a foster care supervisor. We have an additional foster care worker who started last week we have a CSA coordinator who's very seasoned and experienced who will be starting on the 15th that will help keep things on track and in compliance. Um, my projections are that of those 42 cases, within 90 days, we're gonna be able to reduce it by 10. And then an additional three months after that, we'll be able to reduce it by 10 more to a more manageable level of 22 cases. Some of that, I think, will become our new normal because we're facing a lot of issues in the county that are driving up our child protective services calls and our foster care need, right? Um, some of opioid abatement, I'm hoping, will have an impact on some of these circumstances that we're finding families in. Um, so with that said, at the face of it, it looks like a very large number, but that number was based on, again, the historical spending where we were hemorrhaging money, frankly, due to lack of compliance and having these guardrails in place. My hope is that with these new processes in place and we've pulled in at a regional level, our continuous quality improvement folks to come in and help make sure things are on track and improving. Um, any questions about the background on that? All right. <laughs> do, I need, do we need to talk about the amount? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, in the, it's in the, do you all have the cover sheet for this? Yes. Yeah. All right. Are there any other questions or, or issues I can, I can help you address before we move into a vote on this? I want to make sure you have the full picture, the good, the bad and the ugly. And I hope that when you reduce those cases that more cases doesn't take their places. I'm knocking on all the wood, Mr. Perry. We're doing and, um, and everything also, we can. We're also shoring up our prevention staff so that we can, I think over time, because the agency wasn't staffed adequately, it created sort of this accidental direct pipeline from CPS to foster care. Mm -hmm. So we're putting resources in place to shore up the prevention and the in-home services so that we can 
break that pipeline. Anyone have any questions? <clears throat> I move to approve the additional fiscal year 2024 Child Services Act appropriation as presented. We have a motion. Is there a second? This is our children we're talking about. Of the 251000 roughly dollars, how much of that directly goes to the children and not necessarily administration of the program? That's my question. Nothing goes to administration. Every penny of that goes to services that are provided to the children in our care. And that covers everything from mental health services, residential services. We don't have a we don't have a huge number of foster homes in Patrick County. So the majority of these children have been housed or put in therapeutic facilities outside of the county. Second. All right, so I have a motion and a second. Call for a vote, Mr. Marshall. Aye. Aye. Mr. Wood. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Thank as you. The motion carries, and I, I see it every day too, and it's well, I, I will share this. Situation. I will I will commit professionally and publicly to the fact that we will we are striving to be good stewards of that investment and drive down the need for it going forward. And I'm doing everything in my power to make sure that we don't have to spend all of that that you just approved. And I think with and the, we can return it to the county. And I think with the previous resolution, I think that will go a long way in getting the bang for the buck and doing what's right for the kids mm -hmm. with these children. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so that uh, concludes our new business, old business. Um, Ms. Lisa Price Hughes uh, with Virginia Department of Transportation. Good evening. I, uh, you know, we've uh, had our public hearing last month and uh, we've recommended um, some additions to the six year plan, uh, the roads that you requested, um, um, Rockcastle Gorge Road and Wren Hollow Road. And that's in your draft plan should you choose to approve it. Mr. Kennedy, do you have? Did you have a I, I don't forgot what was that one that Tim Handy asked you about last time? Is it Handy, Handy, is that Handy Mountain Road? Handy Mountain Road. Handy Mountain Road. I think the question as to how these are ranked, we, we just need a little clarification. Okay. Um, I think they're ranked what currently one through nine? Yes. Can you can you kind of just explain to us, especially I don't know, and everybody sitting out here? Okay, sure. Um these roads, you can see that the, the dates they were added, and we always recommend adding on to the bottom and keeping the order the same. Um, now, they may not be constructed in that order because, as you know, I explained last time, in order for a road to receive these the bigger allocation of unpaved road funds, the traffic count has to be over 50 vehicles a day. So sometimes it takes us a little while to accumulate funding for roads like Green Spring or Belgium Mountain that are under that 50. We have to use the smaller allocation of this telefee on your title sheet. Telefee can only be put towards those with 50 and below. But yes, historically the board has added on to the bottom. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they will be completed in that order. That's correct. Yes. The ones 50 and above will be, but it, it takes us a while. A lot of, we'll, we'll be able to fund a lot of those projects quicker than the 50 and below. So okay. something like Candy Mountain Road that it says looks like average daily, I guess it's average daily traffic, mm -hmm. ADT? Yes. 75 in front of, you know, shortcut with 40 and some of these other yes. roads out here. Yes. So that might come before some yes. of these other ones. 
Yes, sir. Thanks. Okay. Um, and just as a reminder, there's um, two things to vote on on this, the Long Branch Road resolution and then the six-year plan. All right, so let's... Um, the Long Branch Road resolution. Um, that's Route 668, Long Branch Road from Route 669 to North Carolina State Line. That's up in Ararat. Any questions about that? Any... No further questions. I'll uh, ask for a motion. I move to approve the Virginia Department of Transportation designation of a rural rustic road, Long Branch Road, as presented. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. And call for a vote, Mr. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Kendrick. Aye. Mr. Wood. Aye. And I vote aye as well. <coughs> vote carries. Um, next, we have the proposed six year highway plan. I'm looking at the right one. Any any questions? Any further discussion? I move to approve the Virginia Department of Transportation secondary six-year plan for Patrick County. So I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Yeah, Let's call for a vote, Mr. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Kendrick. Aye. Mr. Wood. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Um, and then we have a letter of support for Route 58 and Spring Intersection, Spring Road Intersection. Um, yes, yeah, so, so this is based on um, some, uh, this is based on concerns that we've heard over, since I've been here really the last six months, and I'm, I'm sure they may have started before that. We requested some um, traffic um, information from our, our dispatch office um, and the board expressed interest in, in, in crafting a formal letter to have this intersection looked at. So we're requesting that VDOT investigate slash fund intersection improvements of Route 58 Spring Road based on crash data. And a letter, the letter is attached. Any questions from the board? If not, I'll uh, call, for a vote, call for a motion. I move to approve a letter of support requesting VDOT to investigate and or fund intersection improvements of Route 58 and the Spring Road intersection based on crash data. I, I second. A, I have a motion and a second. Call for a vote, Mr. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Kendrick. Aye. Mr. Wood. Aye. And I vote aye as well. And I just have one additional item. Um, you know, we've got six-year plans everywhere, but we do have a uh, district-wide six-year plan public hearing in May, May the 7th. It's at 4 p.m. I don't know, Ms. Sims, if you had attended that before, but it is for the whole district and the Commonwealth Transportation Board, several of those members, and the Secretary of Transportation will be there to take any comments that you have. Okay. That's Mr. May the 7th at 4 p.m. And where is that going to be at? Salem Civic Center. Regional. Thank That's you all I much. have. Thank you all. Thank you. I would like to speak real quick about um, the, the road situation. Yes. I, I do think that Handy Mountain Road, uh, being as it connects two parts of the county, uh, I would like to see it done fairly soon. I know it's on the six-year plan. And the other thing is I just want to be known that I would like for our local law enforcement to enforce the speed limits and stop signs at the intersection of 680 and Route 58. It's not a drag strip like a lot of people try to treat it. I think if we reduce it to 45 and enforce it at 45, and the big red signs that say stop, I think that would help a lot as well. Thank you. All right, next we have a broadband update. Um, Mr. Joe Pryder with Charter. Did I say that right? Pritter. Pritter. Close, yes, sir. All right, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Members of the board, thanks for having me. I've got some slides. I'm going to share. Um, my name is Joe Prater. I'm with Government Affairs at Charter. You probably know us by our brand Spectrum. And we've got some builds going down in the southwest corner of the county, one of which that the county supported uh, in our broadband application with the state. And so 
I'm going to come tonight and give a quick update on where we are with that. And they hosted a very well put together tour today of the air at Claudeville construction. Um, I was actually on Long Branch Road, so they've got a lot of good things going on today. <laughs> Thank you. I've still got the dust on my boots from that road. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had great representation. Ms. Sims was here from the county. We had West Piedmont PDC, and then we had some folks from the Virginia Broadband Office amongst our construction leadership, some of our contractors. It was, we've got some pictures to share, but it was, it was a great time. <laughs> Do you want to take like a five minute recess? Can take like a five minute recess, Mr. Perry. <clears throat> Point of privilege, Mr. Chairman. Um, like to take a five minute recess so, yes uh while we're waiting for our um computer and and um video to come up we'll be in re recess for five minutes while we prepare